Hey guys, welcome back to The Control Variable. I'm your host, Kim Cutter. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I think it's not an easy time to be a human in America right now. And at least I'm, I'm finding it a challenging time to be a human. And as usual, I'm also incredibly glad to be here and really, really glad to have you all to talk to and think this stuff through with because life is pretty crazy right now. And just when I think it can't get any crazier, it does. So for today's show, I did something I've never done before, something I never thought I'd do, to be honest. I interviewed a philosopher. His name is Michael J. Sandel. And I wanted to talk to him because there's something that's been bothering me a lot lately. And it's this question that I think maybe only a philosopher can answer properly. My question is this. Why do so many Americans still love and believe in Donald Trump? So we're recording this episode while the January 6th Senate hearings are going on. Former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson just testified. She described President Trump throwing his lunch against the wall of the Oval Office after the 2020 election, trying to grab the steering wheel of his limo away from his driver on the day of the attacks on the Capitol, literally lunging at a security guard. As of this recording, 44% of Republicans would still vote for Donald Trump, and two-thirds think he should still be allowed to hold public office. They still want him as their president. And most of the political experts I talk to tell me it's highly likely that Trump will be elected again in 2024. They say the hearings won't add up to anything in the end, that they'll be swept away with the tide, forgotten like all the other awful things Trump has done. So what is it about Trump? Like, what is he giving people that is so important to them, that moves them so deeply? What is this thing that they can't find anywhere else? In some sense, I've been asking this question since we started the control variable back in 2021. And at times I've actually felt like I'd figured out the answer. I thought, okay, it's that Trump keeps this 250 year old story about white American supremacy and white American Christian masculinity alive. And a lot of Americans were taught to build their identities around that story, their whole lives around that story. And look, I think that that stuff is a big part of Trump's power, but I don't think that's all of it. And the reason I don't think that's all of it is because I can't stop thinking about this couple I interviewed last year during my investigation into the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Their names are Kevin and Priscilla. They're both big Trump supporters. They were both there at the Capitol on January 6th. They said they felt like their country was being stolen from them, like their lives were in danger. They believe in a lot of things that I do not believe in. But when I was talking to them, I couldn't shake the feeling that despite whatever Kevin and Priscilla believed was happening in America, whether it was true or not, there was something real at the core of their outrage, something legitimate about their distrust of our government and the mainstream media and our so-called liberal elite. After I hung up with them, I felt sad. Not scared, not angry, just sad. And I think the reason why is that the whole time I was talking to Kevin and Priscilla, What I felt in my heart more than anything else was that they wanted to be friends. I didn't agree with most of what they were saying. I told them that. But underneath what they were saying, their emotions were coming through too. It was like I could sense beneath their words something deeper, which was along the lines of, we are humans too. We need to be liked too. And liberal America does not like us. I had the sense that Donald Trump had picked up on that and woven it together with this crazy, racist, misogynist story about American greatness, but that really what hooked people like Kevin and Priscilla, what mattered most and ensured their vote was that he seemed to care about them, to like them, and that all of the smart, really important things the Democrats were offering them, like universal health care, lower taxes, so many things, weren't nearly as important to them as feeling like somebody liked them. Somebody wanted them on his team. But I didn't know what to make of any of this until a friend of mine recommended Michael J. Sendell's book, The Tyranny of Merit. I remember when he said that title, Tyranny of Merit, the words kind of sparkled in my head. I thought, now that is something I want to know about. So that's what we're going to talk about today on The Control Variable. We're going to talk to Michael J. Sendell about his book, The Tyranny of Merit. I have to tell you before we go any further that Michael J. Sendell is not really your average philosopher. People are kind of obsessed with him. He travels all over the world giving talks at like the Sydney Opera House and St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He literally packs them in at these places. A class he teaches about justice at Harvard has been watched over 2.8 million times on YouTube. So he's kind of as close to a rock star as a philosopher can get. He's also one of the kindest, most interesting people I've ever met. 
And suffice it to say, his book made me understand Donald Trump's presidency in a whole new way, a really disturbing way. So in The Tyranny of Merit, Sandel argues that our American idea of meritocracy has a kind of cruelty at its core. It means if you succeed in America, if you end up a rich CEO, it's all your own doing. You worked hard, you tried, you got there entirely based on your own merit. And at the same time, it means that if you fail in America, if you somehow don't end up a rich CEO or don't go to college or don't get a great job or God forbid, end up jobless and homeless, that's your fault too. You just didn't try hard enough. And this, Sandel says, is the tyranny of merit. He believes more than anything else, it's what got Donald Trump elected in 2016, it's the thing that fueled the attack on the Capitol, and the thing that seriously threatens to put Trump, or someone equally Trumpish, back into office in 2024. I think he's right. Which is why I'm so excited to have you all here with me for this chance to kind of sit at the feet of the wonderful Michael Sandel and listen to him for a little while. Because I think the future of our country kind of depends on it. So just to give you a little more background, Sandel teaches political philosophy at Harvard University. His writings on justice, ethics, democracy, and markets have been translated into 30 languages. His course, Justice, is the first Harvard course to be made available for free online and on television. It's been viewed by tens of millions of people around the world. His BBC radio series, The Public Philosopher, explores the philosophical ideas lying behind the headlines with audiences all over the planet. And in his new BBC series, The Global Philosopher, Sandel leads video link discussions with participants from over 30 countries on the ethical aspects of issues such as immigration and climate change. So without further ado, here's my talk with the amazing Michael Sandel. Your book... Professor Sandel, was just a huge light bulb for me. So I'm so honored to have you here to talk to me today about that. And I would love to hear how you came to write this book. After 2016, I wanted to make sense of what had happened. There was the vote for Brexit in the UK and then the vote for Donald Trump in the United States. And here really was the diagnosis that... I offer in the tyranny of merit. We've got to go back a few decades and notice that for decades, Kim, the divide between winners and losers had been deepening, poisoning our politics and setting us apart. This has partly to do with the widening inequalities of income and wealth brought about by the age of finance driven globalization. But it wasn't only the economic inequality. It had to do with the changing attitudes toward success that had accompanied the inequality. Those who'd landed on top had come to believe that their success was their own doing, the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserved the full bounty that the market bestowed upon them. And by implication, that those who struggled, those left behind, must deserve their fate as well. Their troubles were their own doing. And this way of thinking about success reflects a seemingly attractive political principle that all of us on the face of it are drawn to, the meritocratic principle. Well, that's the idea of meritocracy, right? There it is. Meritocracy is the simple principle that if chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. Now, what could be the problem with this principle? One problem might be that we fail to live up to it because, as we all know, chances are not truly equal in our society. Children to, born into poor families tend to stay poor as adults, notwithstanding the promise of upward mobility that we associate with the American dream. But there's a deeper problem. The, the meritocratic ideal itself is flawed. It has a dark side, and the dark side is that it is corrosive of the common good. Here's why. Even if we achieved a perfect meritocracy in which chances were truly equal, this way of thinking about success would still encourage the winners to inhale too deeply of their own success. Right, right. To forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way. I call this, in the book, I call this meritocratic hubris. 
Because they've been told that it's their own doing, right? Yes. So that's the narrative. That's where kind of the propagandistic element of, of the meritocracy comes in. Well, that's the, that's the teaching. That's the lesson that the meritocratic ideal projects. So it leads to hubris among the winners, Kim, and to humiliation and resentment on, among those left behind. Part of the meritocratic hubris is that the winners, in a self-congratulatory mm-hmm. vein, tend to look down on those less fortunate than themselves. Now, how does this inform our current political moment? One of the most potent sources of the populist backlash against elites is the sense among many working people that elites look down on them. And the central claim of the book, The Tyranny of Merit, is that this is a legitimate complaint. And this is what you heard, Kim, when you interviewed those Trump supporters. I think it's just interesting because it just resonates with me on kind of like a soul level where there's like a sadness at the heart of even even those who have excelled, where you just kind of know that it's like a hollow kind of excellence. Well, that's very interesting. And you put it very powerfully. There's a, a sadness at the heart of the achievement of those of us caught up in the meritocratic hubris. And this hollowness actually informed the political project of center-left and center-right political parties, Democrats and Republicans, for four decades. So take us back there. Take us back to the 90s. Tell us how and exactly when and how it happened. During the 90s, it was clear that globalization, though it was heaping rewards on some, basically the top 20%, it was bringing inequality and wage stagnation for most working people. And the proponents of this neoliberal globalization project offered workers some bracing advice. Here was the response, the mainstream response of Democrats and Republicans to the widening inequality. They said this, if you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to college. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. You remember these slogans from the 90s and the 2000s. And in a way, this is bracing, inspiring advice. You can make it if you try. But what these elites and mainstream politicians failed to see was the insult implicit in this advice. The insult is this. If you didn't go to college, and if you're struggling in the new economy, your failure must be your fault. That's the implication. So it's no wonder, Kim, that many working people turned against meritocratic elites, delivering this message, offering this response to inequality, which in effect said the problem is not with the structure of the economy that we've created. The problem is not that we deregulated the financial industry, for example, that we did a bailout that helped Wall Street but left ordinary homeowners on their own. The problem is that you didn't improve yourself sufficiently, and we warned you. We warned you that in the new economy, you need a college education. You didn't get one. And now look at where you are. There's something insulting yeah. about this way of contending with inequality. Yeah. And you mentioned, you mentioned a moment ago, Kim, the attitude, the outlook of those in, who have gone to elite institute universities and who occupy the, the reaches of the professional classes, those of us who spend our days in the company of the credentialed can easily forget a simple fact, which is that most Americans don't have a four-year college degree. Nearly two-thirds of Americans do not. I really like your use of the word credentialed because it doesn't inflate the educated over the not so educated, right? It's just a fact. Right. It's like there are people who have yeah. credentials of a certain kind, and there are people who have other values in their life or other places where they find meaning and, and dignity, right? Yes, exactly. But the way we've designed the economy and the kind of cultural understanding that we have evolved has ignored this and has valorized credentialism to such a degree that we've created an economy 
that makes a university diploma a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life. And this is a mistake. Certainly encouraging people to go to college, that's a good thing. I've spent my entire career in higher education. I believe in it. But it's not a solution for inequality. And also, like, what if you don't want to go to college for whatever reason? Like, what if what if it's just not in the cards? Or what if you what if your gifts lie elsewhere? But I, I think why I want to speak out so much about this is because I feel like everyone I know, we were all raised with this story that if you are not smart enough and educated enough to make a really good argument for yourself, then you don't right. really deserve anything. I mean, that's the, that's the implicit belief of most people I know. Yeah, well, this is the core belief that I'm that I describe really. That's what I mean by the tyranny right. of merit. Right. It does amount to a kind of tyranny. And I think it's had devastating political consequences. And that raises the question if the rhetoric of rising, which is what I call this bracing advice, if the rhetoric of rising has lost its capacity to inspire. In fact, if it amounts to a kind of an insult to large swaths of the of working people, what kind of politics should we seek instead? That's the that's the other beyond the diagnosis. That's the question that I try to address in the tyranny of merit. I want to imagine with you the kind of person who might have been profoundly left behind by the rise of the meritocracy and how exactly that would have affected their life. Can, can we do that? Like, can we imagine like how that would have changed their landscape of both like their economic landscape, their spiritual landscape, their community landscape? Yes. And I like the way you distinguish the economic landscape from the spiritual landscape, because I think both are at stake. The economic landscape, that's pretty familiar widening inequality, stalled social mobility, stagnant wages. So people either lost jobs or just didn't make any more money, right? Just didn't advance. Right, right. And, and if you look at the median wage for the average worker over the last 40 years, it's been more or less flat for 40 years in real terms, even as Globalization has heaped enormous rewards on the top 20%. That's the economic landscape. But the spiritual landscape is at least as important because as attention has shifted in the economy from making things to managing money, that's the economic landscape. But the spiritual landscape changed in equally important ways, which is that social recognition and esteem flowed especially to the work and the services performed by the professional classes, and especially by the financial industry. The, the financial rewards there were greatest, but so was the cultural prestige. And the traditional forms of contribution to the common good, making useful goods and, and, and performing useful services, was diminished. Uh, that was old-fashioned. That was not cutting edge. That was not high-tech. That was not entrepreneurial and innovative. That was, That's the old yes. way. We're doing the new way now. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so what was lost, and this is still in the spiritual landscape, was an appreciation for the dignity of work, work in the traditional sense. And what we need to remember is that work is not only about making a living, it's also about contributing to the common good and winning recognition and social esteem, honor for doing so. How would you describe exactly the dignity of work? What you mean by that? The dignity of work consists not just in being paid a decent wage for the work one does. It also involves social recognition, being appreciated, being honored, being respected for the contribution one makes, for the work we do, for the families we raise, for the communities we serve. This is the dignity of work. One of my favorite political figures gave a powerful expression to this, Kim. Robert F. Kennedy is a hero of mine. 
Mine too. And in, in 1968, he put it this way. He said, fellowship, community, shared patriotism, these essential values don't come just from buying and consuming goods together. They come instead from dignified employment at decent pay, the kind of employment that enables us to say, I helped to build this country. I am a participant in its great public ventures. This was Robert Kennedy. This is what I understand as the meaning of the dignity of work. And this civic sentiment largely dropped out of public life and, and led to a kind of hollowed out spiritual landscape during recent decades. And and so this, 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 I think, is the sensibility, the civic sentiment, the spiritual orientation to contribution and to recognition that we need to, to renew and to capture. Yeah. But then I, there is also the part of me that thinks, well, okay, but then also just what about the people who are sick or handicapped or, um, mentally right. ill or unable to contribute, un- unable to work. I mean, I just, I just don't want to leave them out because they're a big yeah. part of life too. Well, that's, it's an important point. And there are really two points there. One of them is that when we speak of the dignity of work, it's important not to restrict dignity and respect to paid work because many of the most important social contributions to the economy and to the common good are not paid are not mediated by the labor market, raising families, for example, or building uh, communities, volunteering in communities within civil society. So broadly speaking, we need a system of public recognition and social esteem and honor and respect that is broad enough to encompass this range of contributions. Now, as for those who, due to disability, are unable to contribute in any of these ways, we need also to recognize that we are all in this together, that that could be us. And here's where we need, where where those who flourish need to to remember the luck and good fortune that help us on our way. We need to recognize our indebtedness to those who make our achievements possible. And we need to, to win the kind of humility that reminds us when we look upon those who struggle, less fortunate than ourselves, that could be me. This tendency of meritocratic hubris goes back a long way. I, I was struck by a quote when I, I quote Max Weber a century ago, who had, I think, a wonderful account of this tendency. He said, the fortunate person is seldom satisfied with the fact of being fortunate. Beyond this, he needs to know that he has a right to his good fortune, and he wants to be convinced that he deserves it, and above all, that he deserves it in comparison with others. And he wants to be allowed the belief that the less fortunate also merely experience their due. So this is, this is the dark side of meritocracy. Yeah. I mean, it means if you won, you deserve to win, and if you lost, you deserve to lose. And I think this is how Donald Trump got elected president, honestly. I, I think exactly that. <laughs> yes. You know, it's like yeah. all these, unfortunately, since the 90s, all of this this giant swath of America has been, you know, the, the media has has focused on a narrative of, of, of meritocratic accomplishment. And people's people have lost their jobs. They have lost the ability to earn money. And their whole lived experience hasn't been reflected back to them with any kind of res- respect or dignity or even like just noticing, right? I mean, I think there's, I felt when I was talking to this couple, Priscilla and Kevin in Texas, who are big Trump supporters, I just, you know, it was like their souls were gravely offended by the American government and by the American media. And and it, it was like they felt unseen in the most profound sense. And you know, the narrative that they'd thrown on top of it about why he was great and and how he was going to help them, that was clearly misguided. But at the same time, right. the, the emotions did not seem to me at all misguided. The emotions struck me yeah. as incredibly real and justified. So it's weird because I'm talking to them and I'm listening to the to the story, which is kind of a, you know, there's it's full of Trump's lies and full of really 
misguided notions about what's happening. But at the same time, underneath, there's this, there are people who are just hurting and they wanted to connect really, they really, like, they wanted to be friends, you know, they really wanted to connect yeah. more than anything. I felt like they wanted to connect, you know, he would be like, listen, you got to come to Texas and like, all oh, we'll do a barbecue mm -hmm. and like, we're going to sit down, you and me, we're going to talk. And I felt no. that truth more than I felt the political narratives that we were discussing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's so powerful. Okay. That's so powerful. And, and especially the paradox of what seems to to elites in the media to be a paradox. Priscilla and Kevin, whom you talked to, Trump did nothing for them in office. <laughs> yeah, it's really important. Yeah, terms. right. And yet, I suspect they stuck with him. Uh, absolutely. Even if, and they stuck with him because he articulated their sense of grievance. And though the the grievances for many, and certainly for Trump were entangled with a lot of ugly sentiments to do with racism and xenophobia and misogyny. It's important not to miss the legitimate grievances with which those ugly sentiments were entangled. And it's, it's hard to do, especially for, for the Democratic Party, because the, the Demo mainstream figures in the Democratic Party said, well, we're offering Priscilla and Kevin paid family leave and better health care, and Trump is taking you know, those things away. So why are they still for Trump? Well, the answer is they're still for Trump because they believe he's on their side. Yeah. They believe he gets their grievance, that he articulates their resentment. And the Democratic Party, by offering various policy proposals, is missing the sense of insult that has gone back really quite a long way. And until the Democratic Party, well, mainstream figures in both parties, but the Democratic Party in particular, had better figure this out. Yeah. If they're to have any hope of of reconnecting with the working class voters who, who essentially have turned against them. You know, in some ways, this explains the vehement hatred of, of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama simply because they really are, I mean, as I'm a big fan, right? And, yeah. and, and voter for both of them. And, and at the same yeah. time, like when I read your book, I thought, Okay, these are the people who put the the Clintons and Obama are the people who put the meritocratic narrative into the sort of the American bloodstream, and yes. you know that became the story that we all endorsed, right, and that we all decided to push forward, and yes. and that m makes me understand why people hate Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, right? Because it just it was this, unfortunately meritocracy was was an idea that left out half the country roughly. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sadly. And in fact, it's striking to think that Joe Biden is the first Democratic nominee for president in 36 years without an Ivy League degree. Wow. That's, right. That's a remarkable thing. So the Democratic Party had so bought into the meritocratic political project, along with its blind spots especially on cultural issues and on honor and recognition and respect, that by 2016, the Democratic Party had become more oriented in its interests, its outlook, its values to the professional classes, to the well-educated, credentialed classes, than to the working class voters who once constituted its base. Right. And what's interesting is that this happened to the Democratic Party in the U.S., it's happened to the Labour Party in Britain. It's happened. It happened to the Social Democrats in Germany, in in France, and in many other European countries. Parties that once drew most of their support from those without a college degree now became the parties of the college educated, and the Democratic Party it being a case in point. And those without a college degree, many went for Trump. You remember that famous line after one of his primary victories, I love the poorly educated. <laughs> this was Trump. It seemed kind of strange at the time, but he was onto this. Oh my God, looking back at it, it's brilliant, right? Because the poorly educated were the people who just, no one no one had given them the time of day for 40 years, right? No one had given acknowledged their humanity right. or, or worth or value in any way. 
here's another very concrete measure of this, Kim. An economist at the Brookings Institution calculated the amount the federal government spends on helping students go to four-year degree programs, $164 billion a year. The amount the federal government spends on technical and vocational training, $1.1 billion, $164 to $1 billion. So this reflects, now, now community colleges, technical and vocational training institutions, these are the places where a large portion of Americans prepare themselves for the world of work and of citizenship. And, and there's this vast disproportion in federal support. It's a financial problem. We woefully underinvest in those forms of learning on which most Americans depend. But it also reflects the credentialist prejudice. It's also, it also reflects our values. So what are we going to do about this? Everyone, all the experts I talk to say that it looks really increasingly likely that Donald Trump or a similar tyrant will be elected president in 2024. And that terrifies me. And I want to do everything I can in my power to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I I want you to talk about the ideas that you, the suggestions that you make about how we create a new narrative beyond the meritocracy for this country and ways that we might implement that narrative in our lives. I would start, Kim, by shifting the focus of public discourse, the political project, focusing less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focusing more on making life better for those who may lack a diploma, but who make essential contributions to our society through the work they do, the families they raise, the communities they serve. So the agenda should focus on renewing the dignity of work. We heard this somewhat in Biden's campaign, not so much as a, as a broad shift in vision, but out of instinct and experience. He talked less about meritocracy and the rhetoric of rising. And he did speak more in his campaign about the dignity of work. I think that's an important first step, but I think we have to go further. So it seems like an economic issue, but the key is to discuss it in this wider ethical civic frame. People have responded historically to claims and possibilities and promises of patriotism, of belonging, of being part of something bigger than themselves. Right, because this is life stuff, right? Okay, right. So this is the core of life stuff that everybody on a certain level yes. cares about. And I, and I think that the technocratic orientation of our public discourse in recent decades has put people off and has, has carried with it the assumption that these questions are, are technical questions for experts, for economists. Here's another example of how we, we could rejuvenate civic politics, climate change. Now, what would it take? Think back to your conversations, Kim, with Priscilla and Kevin. Now, if you had said to them to deal with climate change because we have to follow the science, scientists tell us that if we don't transform our economy, the, the uh, degree of, you know, of the oceans will rise and so on. Scientists tell us that, and we must follow the science. What would Priscilla and Kevin have said? They would have said, I don't believe that science. That's media BS. One American network tells me that there is no such thing as, as global warming, and, and they right. have a very justified lack of trust in the mainstream media. Right. So it's really easy for them to not, not believe that science is, is what they're told by the mainstream media that it is. Well, now there are two ways of responding to that. I, I think you're right. That would be my guess, too, that that's what they would say. Now, there are two responses to that. One response would be to say, people who don't believe in the importance of climate change don't believe in science, and what we really need to do is educate them better in science. The real issue for Priscilla and Kevin is not that they don't understand science no. or that they can't read a newspaper. It's trust. It's, it's the lack of trust yeah. and the impasse over climate change. In many ways, like the struggles over vac COVID vaccines and mask wearing, 
is not about scientific illiteracy. It's about trust. And that's a political question. Yeah. It's not a scientific question. And so Democrats, above all, have to recognize that mistrust of elites, people telling them what science requires them to do, even though that may involve transforming their lives, reconfiguring the economy, if there isn't trust in the political leadership that will enact that reconfiguration, then Priscilla and Kevin are not going to be persuaded. Right, right. So what I'm suggesting is that we need to reconfigure the civic infrastructure of a shared democratic life to enable sites of political participation and deliberation where people within communities can come together and reason together and argue together about big things that matter, but grounded in a way that connects with their everyday lives. I would talk to anybody who sincerely wants to figure this out with me. You know what I mean? Like, right. like anybody right. who thinks, okay, let's just figure out how to make a bridge between between the over the great divide in America. Like sincerely, right. anybody who wants to talk that through and listen and talk, that 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 would be enough, right? It would certainly be a start. I think there's a hunger for it. I think that there's a frustration with the empty, hollow terms of public discourse. I think that people want to be heard. And I think people do want to have the opportunity to encounter and to listen to those with whom they disagree. I I don't accept that we want to retreat in our isolated, privatized enclaves of entrenched opinion. I think there is a hunger for a public life of larger meaning and purpose, which begins with listening listening attentively to those with whom we disagree. Doesn't it also also kind of go back to like this American mythology of like individual achievement and, you know, like I was not raised to ask for help. I was not raised to tell, to say like, I'm having a hard day or I don't understand this. I mean, I had to learn all these skills as an adult. And I do really, Mm. I truly believe, I mean, God bless Emerson, but like, I truly believe that like self-reliance is not serving us all that well. I mean, you have to be self-reliant and we don't, we don't really understand how to be in community that well. I mean, there hasn't been much of a focus on the importance of community, but there's so much been on the hero narrative, right? Yes. And I've, I've never been a great fan of Emerson in part for that reason. Well, good for you. It took me a while. (laughs) He fed, he fed the excesses of of American individualism. Individualism can be a glorious thing, provided it's situated in an appreciation of a common life, provided it's situated in a sense of our indebtedness and the mutual responsibilities that go with that indebtedness. And that's what our public culture has been missing. And that's what I'm hoping in a small way to kind of prompt or or inspire with, with the tyranny of merit. So yeah, the meritocracy, it's a problem. As Sandel says, it makes the winners inhale too deeply of their success, and it makes the losers feel like their lack of success is their own fault, like they weren't smart enough, they didn't try hard enough. So my takeaway is this. While America obviously needs and wants to be a level playing field, a place where people can thrive and succeed regardless of skin color or gender or ethnic background or economic stature, America also needs to be a place where people who like to kick it old school can thrive too. A place where people who don't necessarily identify as smart or urban, who don't get all jazzed up by the idea of going to college or moving to a big city, who would rather say go to trade school and learn how to become a mechanic or a construction worker or work in healthcare or food services, become farmers or craftspeople, that these people matter and they must be included in our American narrative too. They need to be woven into that narrative right alongside our college kids and our techies and our strivers and our achievers. These folks need to be seen too, to feel heard too, to feel like America is on their side too. Because really, I think that's what this comes down to. No more sides, no more us and them, but a weaving now, a blending of narratives that lifts all voices, that gives everyone respect and recognition and the chance to live a good life, however they define it. This is the America I dream of. Thanks for joining me on The Control Variable today, you all. Keep fighting the good fight. See you next time. 
Guys, if you like the show, please be sure to go rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps. And be honest, okay? Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't like. What annoyed the hell out of you? What you want to hear more of? I'll listen. I promise. We're in this together, okay? Let's make something amazing. The Control Variable is brought to you by Atomic Whale Studios, an executive produced by Jonathan Wilson. The podcast was created by Jonathan, Brian Blatstein, and me. Brian Blatstein is the supervising producer. Rob Okendo and I are producers of the podcast. The technical producer and supervising editor is Derek Michaud of Shelby Row Productions. Sound editing is by Alex Aerosmith, and technical support is provided by Eric Totora Patu. Website creative direction by Randy Braceoff. Original music was composed and performed by Dan White. The control variable is managed by Sean Madison. Fact-checking by Kelly Stakopoulos. Megan Petta is our researcher, guest coordinator, and the person who keeps the control variable train on the tracks every day. Finally, I'm your writer and host, Kim Cutter. A very special thanks to everyone who made our show possible. 